Ms. Garcia, and we will hear from the appellant first. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Daniel Scott Carrara, on behalf of the appellant, Alejandro Salinas Garcia. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Sarah Kubashi and Corbin Keller, third year law students at Washington University in St. Louis, who will be arguing the case under my supervision. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Sarah Habashi and I'm appearing on behalf of our client Alejandro Salinas Garcia. We urge the court to find that since Mr. Garcia was not given the benefit of the Fair Sentencing Act, that he should be afforded the right to re-sentence through the First Step Act. There are three prongs as it relates to eligibility under the First Step Act. Two of the, two of the three prongs can be disposed of because the government has conceded that Mr. Garcia meets the requirements. The first is that Mr. Garcia's offense is a covered offense under Section 404 of the First Step Act, which the government conceded in their reply brief, and we agree with them. The second is that Mr. Garcia's offense was committed before August 3rd, 2010, which, from the record, is obviously true. The main issue and contention in this case is regarding the last prong, which is whether Mr. Garcia received the benefit of the Fair Sentencing Act, which means that he received that, that during sentencing, there is some type of contemplation or thought about the FSA. We argue that he was not given the benefit of the FSA because the record, record is silent on the FSA and United States v. Dorsey. First, the district court erred by only looking at the date of sentencing to assume that Mr. Garcia had the benefit of the FSA. Second, the sentencing judge did not give clear and robust reasoning when sentencing Mr. Garcia, leading us to analyze the silence in the record. Third, Mr. Garcia's PSR was never updated and reflected in the substantial change of law from the Supreme Court, which is United States v. Dorsey, where the Supreme Court found that defendants indicted before the FSA was enacted still get the benefit of the FSA. Because of these reasons, it's evident that Mr. Garcia was not given the benefit of the FSA. We ask for the court to find the district court erred when denying Mr. Garcia eligibility. Counsel, um, thank you. you. You mentioned Dorsey. And I was wondering whether you've seen any cases where a court has held that a defendant was not sentenced in accordance with the FSA uh, when the defendant was sentenced after Dorsey or in our circuit, I guess, after Dorsey and Muzon, which recognized Dorsey's effect. Uh, yes, Your Honor. So a case that's directly on point this was decided by a sister circuit, the 11th Circuit, which is United States v. Joseph, which we submitted a 28-J letter about. Um, and in United States v. Joseph, um, what happened was he, jo Joseph was sentenced after Dorsey. Um, and at the sentencing hearing, his counsel actually referenced the Fair Sentencing Act. Um, and later, the 11th Circuit found that even though it, he referenced the Fair Sentencing Act, it was, it was clear from the record that he was not given the benefit. But I guess the difference there, right, is that it was after Dorsey, but, and I, I take your word for that, I, I don't recall, um, but it was before the 11th Circuit recognized the change in its precedent. Um, and, and here, this is after, after both of those, right? It's after Dorsey and after Muzone. Um, so Your Honor, actually, the Fourth Circuit, so the case that we were in, the least five in this case, we believe, was when the Fourth Circuit abrogated uh, Bullard, United States v. Bullard, which was originally the, the precedent, um, was United States v. Allen, which was actually decided in 2013 after Mr. Garcia was sentenced. But we actually recognized it earlier. We recognized it in New Zone, which was in, uh, let's see, July 2012, um, which was before he was sentenced. And I think in I think in the Eleventh Circuit case, the defendant was sentenced before Dorsey, um, according to my notes. So, are you aware of any other case where a defendant was was sentenced after Dorsey and it was found to not be in accordance with the FSA? Your Honor, there are a few cases. Um, I don't have them in front of me for some odd reason, but there are definitely a few cases where that occurred. Um, and just to kind of go back uh, about Mazone, I apologize if I'm, I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, um, but even if, well, Ms., well, of course, Mr. De Garcia was sentenced after Mazone, however, there's still nothing in the record that shows that he was, that Mazone or Dorsey was considered when he was sentenced. 
right? So this court decided just a few months ago in United States v. Collington that whenever there are sentencing issues, there should be some robust reasoning and robust explanation. There is nothing of the sort in Mr. Garcia's case. Um, you know, the, the sentencing judge said that for all purposes of sentencing, he would be using the PSR, um, which we, we argued the PSR was incorrect to begin with. There was no point in this case that the PSR was correct. Um, and to, just to have a little bit of more affirmative evidence that the PSR was incorrect, Mr. Garcia was sentenced under 841B1 subpart A. Um, however, if he was actually indeed sentenced in accordance with the FSA, he would have been sentenced under 841B1A and 841B1B. Um, so the lack of the second charge shows that the FSA was not, well, that in combination with the silence on the record, shows that the FSA was not thought of um, at the time that the PSR was finalized, at the time of sentencing. And obviously that means that Mr. Garcia should be eligible for first step um, first step act resentencing hearing because of that. So, so I think you, I think you said got the benefit of the Fair Sentencing Act. Uh, do you really mean that, or do you mean in accordance with the Fair Sentence Act, which seems to be the focal issue in this case? It is it's uh, certainly uh, uh, Dorsey had uh, was out. Uh, certainly, the Fair Sentencing Act was in place. The issue we now confront is there something to indicate he was sentenced in accordance with it in light of the fact that one can commit a crime before it and sentenced after it before the Dorsey case and after the Dorsey case. Uh, so from that perspective, what 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 does the term in accordance with, how does that uh, uh, relate to this case? Yes, Your Honor, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, so we argue that a defendant who is sentenced according to the Fair Sentencing Act or even received the benefit of the Fair Sentencing Act is A, they would have, you know, the both whatever statutes are applicable to them. So in our case, 841B1B would have been added to the PSR. Um, and, and another thing would be that we would expect some type of reference to the Fair Sentencing Act. Again, it's completely but silent. But my question is, he does not need to receive the benefit of the act. What he needs is to be sentenced in accordance with it. So he may not get the benefit of it, but he, if he's sentenced in accordance with it, it's a, it's a different term. And it also relates to why it's important in this particular case, at least from what I understand your argument to be, that uh, an individual who is sentenced after Dorsey, you, we still have the obligation to determine if he was sentenced in accordance with the act. Yes, Your Honor. So we, well, we don't believe that he was sentenced in accordance to the act as well. So we don't think he got a benefit and he wasn't a, a sentenced in accordance to the act. Um, and, you know, the First Step Act is a remedial statute, right? And so what's your best evidence that he wasn't sentenced in accordance with the uh, act? So our best piece of affirmative evidence is the PSR. So in the PSR, like I said before, um, he was sentenced under Section 841. B1A only and not subpart B. Um, and if you look at his co-defendants who had essentially the same exact drug charges, they were they were uh, their PSR had A subpart A and B. So it goes to show that there is some type of confusion at this time within the district. So you know there was some muddled case law. The FSA was was pretty new at this time, and you know unfortunately like they just didn't get it right. And since they didn't get it right, the First Step Act, which is what Congress intended to fill the gaps, um, fill the gaps left by the Fair Sentencing Act, which this court decided just a week ago in U.S. v. Nicholson that he should be eligible for a resentencing under the First Step Act. Additionally, going back to what the First Step Act really means here, this is Mr. Garcia's last shot. He didn't get the benefit of the, of the Fair Sentencing Act. He didn't get, he, we don't believe that he was sentenced in accordance with it either based off of the, the lack of the charge in the PSR. And Congress intended for defendants just like Mr. Garcia to have another shot with the First Step Act. Again, the, the First Step Act in U.S. v. Worsing that this court decided is a remedial statute. And U.S. v. Nicholson, again, just decided a week ago, this court said that the First Step Act is left to fix the gaps left in the original sentence in the light of intervening, intervening circumstances. We believe that intervening circumstances is the case law that has come out from 2012 when Mr. Garcia was sentenced until now 
that shows that the law was a little bit muddled and now it's more. Um, additionally, just to bring up a little bit of what could be thought of during this case, um, you know, we believe that there the practical reason that Mr. Garcia should be the practical reason that Mr. Garcia. Am I still listening? Oh, sorry, Your Honors. I think my video stopped. It is. I apologize, Your Honors. Um, so going back to what I was saying, the, oh, the practical effects here um, is, you know, we're just talking about a very discreet, um, I'll just keep going, uh, a very discreet amount of time, right? We're talking about 2012 to, two, well, June 2012 when Dorsey was decided, to 2013 when Allen was decided. There is not, this, this isn't going to open the floodgates to relitigation. There is maybe a handful, maybe two of, of uh, defendants who are in this, you know, this muddled case law, what, you know, judges may not have known exactly what was going on, were they following Bullard, were they following Dorsey, um, and, it, you know, especially that's what we argue since there, well, you know, with no mention of it at all um, in the record. So, you know, this is not- Counsel, so can I- Can I ask a question on that point about being a, a mention of the Fair Sentencing Act? Um, what if, and this is a hypothetical, it's not our case, but uh, what if at the sentencing, um, someone mentioned the Fair Sentencing Act and the judge said, you know, I'm aware of the Fair Sentencing Act, but it doesn't change anything in this case. Um, and then everything else was the same, you have the same, everything else. Would that, would he then have been sentenced in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act because the judge acknowledged he was aware of it, but it didn't change the ultimate range because powder set the range. Um, would would your answer to the in accordance question be different then? Um, your Honor, I think in that hypothetical, I would say maybe, right? So if, because the FSA was discussed, maybe there is a chance, even though, um, you know, the PSR, so you said that was the only change. Now, if the PSR still is incorrect, I think that there is still some leeway there. But I think in that case, it would be a stronger um, explanation or a stronger defense that the judge did think about it, and it was kind of in accordance. Um, but again, so the if PSR the judge was, if the judge mentioned it and said it doesn't change anything, that could be in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act. But if the judge doesn't mention it, even though it doesn't change anything, it, it wouldn't be in accordance. Oh, no, Your Honor, I apologize. I misunderstood your question. No, that would not be in accord. This court decided in the United States v. Rabat that even if it doesn't change anything, that does not affect the eligibility of, oh, sorry, you said the Fair Sentencing Act. Yeah, yeah. I, the, I don't believe that it would still be in accordance um, because, again, the PSR would not have been corrected. So if the judge said, I, I'm aware of the Fair Sentencing Act, but it doesn't change the sentencing range here mm -hmm. because, you know, powder cocaine sets the range that would still not be in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act? We don't believe so, Your Honor, because as, because the Fair Sentencing Act, if, if, if the Fair Sentencing Act is to explain, the Fair Sentencing Act, I apologize, was created to explain the, or to take away the disparity between powder cocaine and crack cocaine. If the defendant in your hypothetical had crack cocaine, even if the range would be the same, they should get the benefit of the Fair Sentencing Act. When we think about anchoring, sometimes, which this court discussed in U.S. v. Woodson, sometimes depending on how many sentences are in front of them and what the mandatory minimums and man minimums and uh, maximums are, judges sometimes decide where the sentencing lies. I, everything needs to be in front of the judge. So I do not believe that if the judge just said, "Oh, I'm not going to change it because it wouldn't," you know, I'm not going to talk about the FSA because it's not going to change anything. That would still be incorrect. Everything needs to be in front of the judge, and the judge does need to consider that because of those reasons. Um, yes. Uh, additionally, I just wanted to point out really quickly, the PSR was incorrect, but also the judgment, which is on Joint Appendix 76, does not only have 841B1A. So just to further give evidence that it's not just the PSR that was incorrect, the judgment was incorrect as well. Um, what was the JA site for the judgment? Um, JA 76. Thank you. Um, so if there's no, oh, well, I, so because of those reasons, you know, we believe that the 
Mr. Garcia is eligible under the First Step Act, because again, we're not talking about the merits of how long he's supposed to be sentenced. This is just about the fact that the district court erred when they said that he was not eligible. So we believe that he is eligible under the First Step Act, and we ask for the court to remand. Thank you, counsel. We'll hear from government's counsel. May it please the court. Amy Ray for the United States. Your honors, the district court properly denied Mr. Garcia's motion for a reduction of sentence because Mr. Garcia was sentenced approximately six months after the Supreme Court made it clear that defendants like him would be subject to the Fair Sentencing Act. And there's nothing in the record to suggest that the district court did not follow Dorsey's directive. But there's nothing in the record to suggest that the district court did recognize even that the Fair Sentencing Act was applicable. So we're left to read the district court's mind and just assume that the district court considered it correctly. Go ahead. So, Judge Thacker, I think that's not correct. With all due respect, I think a couple of things. First of all, we don't presume a district judge doesn't follow Supreme Court law. And we don't ask the district court to say on the record that it's following the law that's in effect at the time. Additionally, what about the pre-sentence report? Shouldn't the pre-sentence report have been amended to correctly acknowledge that the Fair Sentencing Act was in play here? No, Your Honor, because the Fair Sentencing Act made absolutely no difference to the statutory range that Mr. Garcia was subject to. So Mr. Garcia was sentenced. So no pre-sentencing. Go ahead. Well, Mr. Garcia was sentenced in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act. The Fair Sentencing Act required that. How do we know? Because he was subject to a statutory range of 10 years to life based on the powder cocaine, the quantity of powder cocaine that he admitted he was involved in his offense. And it is absolutely ordinary for a pre-sentence report when a defendant is convicted of a conspiracy offense that involves two drug amounts for that pre-sentence report only to list the highest level, the statutory range that's actually going to govern the district court's sentencing decision. So in this case, the range that governed that decision under the Fair Sentencing Act was 10 years to life. And that's why the pre-sentence report was not amended. The only thing the pre-sentence report could have possibly been amended. And what is the most analogous case to the argument that you're making? There is no case that I'm aware of that holds that a district court did not apply Dorsey after Dorsey. So and one thing that I will say, and this is obviously not something that I can cite to, but what I would say is this. For those of us who were litigating these issues in 2010 through 2011, every judge who sentenced defendants in drug cases was waiting for Dorsey. The government had to decide what position to take. We ultimately litigated it. We won that issue in Bullard and we lost it in Dorsey. And we knew that. And as soon as Dorsey, there was a petition for certiorari. We were all paying attention, the district judges, the defendants attorneys and the U.S. attorneys, assistant U.S. attorneys like me who were getting ready to have to handle. It really seems like it would have been mentioned. No, Your Honor, it wouldn't have been. Six months later, Dorsey was done. There was no reason to mention it. So if we were dealing with a case in which you had worked in and probably wouldn't be confronting this issue, you mentioned the PRSR here. And as I recall, it seems like the subsection for cocaine base was a bit off. What was the problem there? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm not sure what Your Honor is referring to. The judgment didn't refer to the correct subsection for the cocaine base. It wouldn't need to because the cocaine base wasn't an issue in this case. He didn't admit to cocaine base. So the judgment refers. So you don't think it should have at all. You don't think it should have referred to it at all. No, Your Honor, it didn't make any difference whatsoever. There was no reason for that judgment or the pre-sentence report to. The only thing that referred to cocaine base was the indictment. Once Mr. Garcia pled guilty and admitted that he was responsible for at least five kilograms of powder cocaine, that took, for all intents and purposes, the crack cocaine out. 
Now, the, there was a uh, marijuana equivalency that was determined in this case through the pre-sentence report in terms of the guideline application because you had not only you had um, powder and crack, and as I recall, you had a small amount of marijuana. But what you have in the judgment is the appropriate designation, which is that he was convicted and sentenced under Section 841B1A. And that is the only... So the judgment there... does mention the cocaine base, is what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that, Your Honor. I, I don't recall. And Doesn't I'm happy it? To, I Doesn't can take it? a look at well, it. Take, take a look at it, uh, because uh, I think the judgment specifically says it. It says conspiracy to distribute and possess with intent to distribute cocaine and cocaine base. Schedule to control does. substance. Sorry, I'm, I apologize, Your Honor. It probably says that... At JA-76. Um, yes, I know. Thank you, Judge Baxter. I appreciate that. Um, right. So, so, so says, but, you know, I want to go back to your general statement in terms that, you know, that it seems that you're saying, as Judge Bell said, is, well, that was the law. You got to presume that's the case. Well, the law is the law in nearly all cases in courts make errors. And that's the problem we have here. You, you don't maintain that even after Dorsey, a court could make an error with regard to not sentencing under, under this, do you? No, Your Honor, but I would respectfully suggest and that's that the this problem court, we have here knowledge. is we, we are dealing with a situation in which we're simply looking at the fact alone. We're not saying that, it, that, that, that he wasn't, but there's nothing here to indicate, in fact, he was. Your Honor, this court would have to presume that the district court made a legal error six months after the Supreme Court no, decided that's not the case. We don't, we don't presume, we don't presume <laughs> errors. Errors occur because we don't have evidence to support that anything was done in compliance with the law or something was not, not done as it should be done. I mean, we presume that everybody's going to follow the law. And if we had that presumption, why would we even have appeals on most of these cases? We start out and says, we're just going to presume you follow the law. And that's the end of that. That's not the case we're having here. We're looking at the facts, and we know that based upon the timing of this situation right here, that it doesn't take much to simply make a, an inquiry beyond the fact of, well, that's the law, that's the end of it. Your Honor, there was no dispute of fact in this case. There's nothing on this record that suggests Mr. Garcia didn't get the benefit of the act. And I note that if Mr. Garcia thought the Fair Sentencing Act had not been applied. He had a direct appeal and a motion to vacate that he could have asked this court to say, he could have corrected if he thought it was wrong. There's nothing on this record. There is no dispute of fact. There is no fact for the district court to find here. We have so the tell me. So sits. tell me again about this judgment on JA-71 and its the reference that, refers it, that it does not have 841B, a 1B, it has just B1A. It wouldn't have B1B, Your Honor, with all due respect. But it would have B1A. It would have that. That's okay? Absolutely, because that, is the, that was the governing statute. B1A governed Mr. Garcia's sentence. Under the Fair Sentencing Act, B1A determined the statutory range, and that statutory range was at least 10 years and no more than life, up to life. So that is the only statutory reference that the district court could have or should have made. And there is nothing in this record to suggest, and it's, it's just, it's, it's, there's no way that this court, in my, with all due respect, should hold that a, a court without any evidence that the district court erred, that it did err. There, there's nothing for the district court to find here. We have all the facts in front of us right now. We, we, we don't, there's no way for the district court to find one way or the other apart from the evidence that we have. And what we have is this, the timing is critical. If Mr. Garcia had been sentenced in May of 2012, a month before Dorsey issued, I would have agreed that the district court can't simply say because he was sentenced after the effective date of the act, then he's not eligible under 404C of the First Step Act. I would 100% agree. But when we have a defendant who is sentenced six months after Dorsey and after Muzong, and we do not have any information he applied, we do know that the court applied the first step, the Fair Sentencing Act, because Mr. Garcia was subject to 10 years to life under that act. We know he applied the act. 
that at least that was that was the governing law at the time so i just there's not going to be in a case like this anything in the record that will tell you for sure that the court applied the fair sentencing act unless this court is going to assume that every time a law changes the judge has to say oh the supreme court issued a decision six months ago that governs and so we're going to say the, there was no reason for the pre-sentence report to refer to b1b none whatsoever because b1b doesn't govern mr did not govern mr garcia's sentence and so I you maintain the that the sentence that he actually received he could only get under the fair sentencing act I'm saying that both before and after the Fair Sentencing Act, the statutory range was 10 years to life. And I have looked at- So other I'll ask again, are you maintaining that the sentence he received is, could only be gotten under the Fair Sentencing Act? No, he could, he could receive it under the Fair Sentencing Act and it's the same statutory range that applied before, which is why the pre-sentence report doesn't refer to it, why there was no supplement issued. Had the Fair Sentencing Act affected anything about the statutory range to which Mr. Garcia was subject, I can tell you that Judge Voorhees would have ordered and requested a supplemental pre-sentence report. In, in post-Dorsey, that's exactly what would have happened. Or pre-Dorsey, and then, you know, if, if, there, if it had been sentenced, that's what would happen. But there was no reason for the court to do that after Dorsey in this case, because the statutory range did not change. And, and, you know, again, this is, not, this is not anything that is in the record, but it is not unusual where a defendant is found, pleaded guilty to an, a conspiracy offense that um, involves multiple drugs. Some drugs would trigger B1B, some tr drugs would trigger B1A. It is absolutely routine for both the judgment and the pre-sentence report to refer only to B1A. There's no reason to refer to the statutory range that does not apply. Five years to 40 did not apply to Mr. Garcia. So it makes sense uh, that there's nothing in the record that says that he applied the Fair Sentencing Act. There wouldn't be. And what we do know is that Mr. Garcia was sentenced under the statutory range that applied under that act. I don't think that it is, uh, I can't think of another context in which this court would <coughs> make Yes. Judge Thacker, I'm sorry, did you have a question? No, I'm sorry, I just coughed. Oh, okay, sorry. You lit up and I wasn't sure if, uh, if I oh, was talking. Oh, I lit to up. You. I like that. Well, yeah. <laughs> Your box. Um, anyway, it's like the Brady Bunch <laughs> or something. Um, so uh, my, all I was going to say is that I think to rule against the district court here means that we have to say that it's, it's that there should be something on the record that tells us that six months after a decision that was not in, and by the way, this isn't like a categorical approach decision where, you know, what exactly does it mean? What does Mathis mean? What exactly does it mean under Johnson? No, this was a bright line Supreme Court rule. If you were sentenced after the effective date of the, of the Fair Sentencing Act, you got its benefits. It was not confusing. It was very straightforward. The judges knew that. And so there wouldn't be anything in the record, I would respectfully suggest, that would indicate that a judge applied a Supreme Court decision that had been in effect for six months. If your honors don't have any further questions, um, we respectfully request that you affirm the judgment of the district court. So Thank I you. want to be clear in oh. terms of your, your presentation that the in the sentencing under the Fair Sentencing Act, there's nothing from which this court can differentiate that would indicate that a person has been sentenced under that act or any other act, it's, there's nothing, they don't, there's no indication. In other words, a court doesn't have to, nor is there any indication that a person is sentenced under the Fair Sentencing Act, any different than the previous act. Is that what you're saying? I, yeah, I'm saying that, let's say, for example, Your Honor, that... No, I um, want to know the answer to that uh, question, because what I want I, to know is how, in other words, in any case, it could be the Fair Citizen Act, could have been some other act, could have been anything, whatever comes up here, there is no way to determine, or in it, nothing the court needs to even indicate that it is sentencing it under that particular act. That is your statement, no. right? 
I'm right. Well, My then, statement then, is what, this, well, then tell if, me, tell, let me, let me ask the next question and then, then I want you to expound. Okay. So if, 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 because what you're telling me, you don't have to have any indication whatsoever of a fair sentencing act to some extent you're saying that if, if that's so, then how do we ever know they actually are sentencing under the fair sentencing act? The same way that we know, Your Honor, for example, that when a defendant is sentenced under a RICO offense, that the court applied RICO. If the defendant is sentenced under the um, the uh, well, in, in a RICO offense, act, in a RICO offense, the pre-sentence report and the court and everybody else probably in the courtroom would have at least mentioned the word RICO. That's how we would have known. It would have in the judgment, yes, and in the pre-sentence report, but this. This judgment does refer to the Controlled Substances Act, which is what the Fair Sentencing Act amended. So the Controlled Substances Act is B1A and so B1B. It, so, so it's just the date. It's just because it's after the date of the Fair Sentencing Act. That's how we know that uh, we just assume that, that courts don't make mistakes. Your Honor, we don't assume that six months after the Supreme Court has told a district court that anyone who's sentenced after August 3rd, 2010 receives the benefit of the Fair Sentencing Act, that the court didn't do that. So yes, well, we assume part, that judges part of that, can- Part of that is understanding that the, the reason the Supreme Court did it was that's exactly what they were doing. They weren't doing it in accordance with the way the Supreme Court made a pronouncement of it. So then you're talking about changing a course of action that the court is taking, the court has been doing it wrong. And don't you think that when the, when the Supreme Court tells you to do it right, they would at least indicate something that they are now doing it the right way? You know, I, I'm not saying there's a presumption either way. There's a presumption that you wouldn't have gotten it wrong in the first instance, but it's being done wrong. And now Supreme Court tells you to do it a different way. And now you'll say, well, that means they're just not doing it wrong anymore. They're doing it right. And you don't have to Your tell Honor, us anything. If, if the Fair Sentencing ha Act had made a whit of difference in this case, it would have been mentioned. If Mr. Garcia's sentencing range was altered at all, then it would have been mentioned. It would have likely been mentioned. Though six months later, maybe, maybe not. But you would have seen, you know, that the original pre-sentence report said B1A and the next one says B1B. Year, years this, later, years later, after the Booker decision that made the guidelines advisory and not um, mandatory, every PSR and every district court sentencing mentions and acknowledges their awareness that the um, guidelines are advisory and not mandatory. And that's years after Booker. So we don't assume in other situations. I just I, actually, don't understand Honor, why we would assume here, except for the Honor, fact that you're saying it doesn't matter. The sentence wouldn't have mattered. Right. I mean, I, let, me, let me address your Booker example. It wouldn't have mattered if, if, judge, if, the, if the judges said anything about Booker. Booker applied and everyone knew it. But Booker, of course, was a, you know, a complete sea change in terms of the process and how a district court um, assessed what sentence a defendant could get under the guidelines. Very different. But if a district court didn't mention Booker in its pronouncement of sentence, I would respectfully suggest that no one six months after Booker would assume that a district court was applying the guidelines in a mandatory fashion. Everyone knew in January of 2005. I'm not sure every district court knew that. In January, without Judge Thacker, I, I'd be surprised if there was a district court in the land in January of 2005 that did not know about Booker. Uh, and U.S. versus now, Martinovich. Pardon me? U.S. versus Martinovich. There was a district court there. that did not, was not aware that the sentencing guidelines were no longer mandatory. So thankfully, it was, it's on the record. So we know Fair one enough. way or the other. I, I, I hear your honor. I think that it would be, there were, there were questions after Booker about when and how it applied under plain error review and things like that. It was a sea change. And yes, after that, the judges articulated it in a different way, but there are laws that change the way we apply, uh, that should decide when a statute is effective. I'm sorry. I know your not. time is almost up and, and I just want to give you a chance to just 
lay out for me again at least so I understand why it didn't make a difference. Oh, because Your other. Honor, sure, because he pled guilty and admitted that more than five kilograms of powder cocaine were involved in his offense. So under Section 841B1A, five kilograms triggers the highest statutory range of 10 years to life. That's the same statutory range that would have applied before the Fair Sentencing Act for an offense involving 50 kilograms or more of crack cocaine. But because he admitted to that high, and I see my time is up, if Judge Wynn, if I may finish answering please, Judge please. Of course so you after, uh, thank you, Your Honor. After, um, once the fair, fair sentence, when he pled guilty to five kilograms of powder cocaine, that meant that that higher range was going to apply because the Fair Sentencing Act did not alter any statutory range as applied to a powder cocaine offense. So it didn't make any difference. There was no reason to get a supplemental. Pardon me. Thank you. Further questions from the judges, Judge Russian, or Judge Thacker, any other questions? No, thank right. you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Ray. you, Your Honors. Uh, we'll now hear from the appellate. You have a little bit of rebuttal time. <laughs> Just waiting for the clock to run up. May it please the court, Corbin Keller for Mr. Alejandro Salinas Garcia. As Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, as Judge Wynn pointed out, what we're looking to is whether Mr. Garcia is eligible for a first step act rehearing. And for that, as this court held in Rabat, all that requires is that the defendant committed a covered offense and that he was not sentenced in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act at the original sentencing. Now, the district court said Mr. Garcia was ineligible because it simply said Mr. Garcia was sentenced in 2012 and the Fair Sentencing Act went into effect in 2010, and therefore he must have received the benefit. But as we know, the law at the time was very muddled, and so um, and the government concedes that. Well, at- uh, Ms. Ray says that it, it, it would not have made a difference, that he was sentenced um, in accordance with the uh, uh, what he pled guilty to, and the Fair, uh, Fair Sentencing Act wouldn't have mattered. Yes, Your Honor, but uh, as, as we've noticed, the, the purpose is to be sentenced in accordance with, not necessarily that the sentence may have been lowered, but that the sentence, but that merely he be sentenced in accordance with the standards of the Fair Sentencing Act. Likewise, it may have made a difference based on how the sentencing judge viewed it as an anchor point. As this court work, recognized in United States v. Woodson, this changing threshold to the Fair Sentencing Act could affect the anchoring point on which a sentencing judge decides to either depart from the, depart from the guidelines, either to raise or lower it. So, for instance, the, the sentencing court had seen, yes, yes counsel. Um, the attorney for the government pointed out that um, that Mr. Garcia did not admit to um, or plead guilty to possessing the crack cocaine. Um, but I know it, it shows up in the judgment. Uh, how do we make sense of that? I think your, your anchor point argument um, makes me think of that. If it was the judge thinking about crack cocaine or not, since Mr. Garcia didn't plead guilty to possessing the crack. Your Honor, I'm not exactly sure how to square away the government's uh, arguments there because we believe that the crack cocaine was very essential to the charge. The charge, the indictment itself listed all three drug amounts, including the crack cocaine. Uh, the uh, judgment and sentencing order also reflected the crack cocaine amount, and that's what Mr. Garcia pled guilty to. So likewise, because the crack cocaine, account, the crack cocaine amount is covered by the Fair Sentencing Act, we should have seen it come up in subpart B and subpart A, which is not the case. And so we see from the record that there is nothing there to show that subpart B was considered in either the indictment, the PSR, the guilty plea, or the sentencing order. But meanwhile, Mr. Garcia's co-defendants, uh, who were also likewise charged with the same drug amounts, did have the benefit of subpart B in some of their judgment sentencing orders. I'll point to the JA at 64 to show to see that a co-defendant was sentenced under subpart A and subpart B. Yet Mr. Garcia, with the amount of crack cocaine that should have been sentenced under subpart B, was not sentenced under subpart B. So contrary to the government's arguments, we actually have evidence that suggests that Subpart that the Fair Sentencing Act was never considered because the amount of crack that it modified, uh, it, it was never referenced anywhere in the record. Likewise, uh, the PSR itself was prepared by the government 
and it was incumbent on the government and the court to recognize uh, and to enforce the sentencing thresholds that Congress had passed in the Fair Sentencing Act. So Mr. Garcia alone shouldn't be in the position of having to prove, uh, to prove a negative, basically, to say, uh, show how you did not receive the benefit of the Fair Sentencing Act. And we believe that there's silence in the record, and that silence should not be construed against Mr. Garcia, which is exactly what the 11th Circuit did in the United States v. Joseph um, after the district court wrongly decided that Joseph had been sentenced in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act, again, by merely looking at the dates of sentencing, uh, that the appellate court there dove into the record and said, based on the record, we can't tell if he received the benefit. And because of that, we're going to say that Mr. J uh, Joseph was not uh, sentenced in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act. Likewise here, there's silence in the record that suggests that Mr. Garcia was not sentenced in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act. Now, whether the standards may have been higher or lower, it doesn't really matter uh, when we're looking at terms of, in terms of eligibility for First Step Act purposes, which merely says that if a defendant committed a covered offense and was not sentenced in accordance with the Fair Sentencing Act, he should now be eligible for a First Step Act recall, which is exactly what Congress intended to do uh, to rectify long-standing disparities in uh, sentencing amounts. And so based off of the clear intent uh, of Congress, recognized in U.S. v. Prabhat, we ask that this court find that Mr. Garcia uh, is eligible for a First Step Act rehearing and to remand the district court. Uh, and if there are no further questions, Your Honors, I will close. Judges, anything further? No. All right. I want to recognize that the Counsel for the appellant uh, from Washington University, I believe. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you at the Fourth Circuit. Professor, uh, it is a pleasure to have you here along with the students. I want to also say I recognize you're a court appointed, and this court really benefits from the services of lawyers and court appointments, and we thank you for your service. And Ms. Ray, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you all, and have a good day. Your Honor. We'll proceed to the next case. <laughs>
um, I'm sorry, not Hill. Uh, I'm referring to O'Neill versus Hilton Head. It, that was an agreement that was one paragraph. It says, I understand that my employer makes available arbitration for resolution. And I understand and I agree to submit any of my, any of my complaints uh, to uh, a final decision of the arbitration panel. And in that case, Judge Wilkinson said that any doubts concerning the arbitral issues should be resolved in favor of arbitration. Whether the problem at hand is the construction of the language or the alle allegation of waiver or delay, it said that the employer had proffered the agreement, the employee had accepted the agreement, and therefore each of them was bound by the by the process. Uh, that the, the court went on to say that you know the employer having uh, created this agreement and asked the employee to to agree to submit all claims to arbitration. The employer was not permitted to just walk away and say it only applies to the employee. It doesn't apply to me. In this case, our agreement, uh, nationwide agreement, is much more mutual. I mean, it talks about aggrieved parties. It doesn't say just that the employer, I'm sorry, just that the employee is. Uh, furthermore, Judge uh, Gallagher decided this case really based on the a clause that is, appears at the end of the uh, manual and also at the end of the acknowledgement of uh, where the employee signs and, and says that he's agreed to these things. Now that clause, uh, it appears, it's the last page of the agreement uh, of the handbook. And what it says is that, first of all, it points out that there are several agreements contained within this handbook. And I think that's very important because the effect of Judge Gallagher's opinion is to vitiate all four of the other agreements. There is an agreement with respect to uh, the use of demonstrator vehicles, that an employee is not allowed to loan the vehicle to someone else, can't drive around uh, with four or five. Do you employees. agree that the modification clause um, that you're talking about is uh, uh, illusory as applied to anything? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I think what the, what the clause says and what it talks about is company benefits. There are a variety of benefits described in the handbook and the employer. It comes at the, the end right. of the acknowledgement, correct? It comes it's at on the, the acknowledgement the form. Yeah, but it's and a, does the acknowledgement form, uh, is the employee acknowledging the arbitration provision? The employer, I'm sorry, the employee in the beginning of the form makes reference, there's a specific reference to that agreement and there's several references to other agreements. And then the last paragraph talks about policies, procedures, and benefits, which the so employer may So is the employee, change. by signing that acknowledgement receipt, acknowledging to the arbitration provision? This is evidence that he read it and understood the agreement. But it also- Doesn't the, doesn't the arbitration provision itself refer to the acknowledgement receipt that the employee must sign in order to acknowledge the arbitration provision? Um, well, it says, the last paragraph says, by my signature on the acknowledgement receipt, I confirm I've read and understood each of the four paragraphs set forth above in this agreement. But it, it, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the disclaimer, if you will, does not say that the other agreements, this agreement and the other three agreements are subject to change at the whim of the employer. It doesn't say that. It doesn't refer to agreements being subject to changes in the future. And in other decisions- Isn't, so the, your... isn't the modification clause very similar to modification clauses that have been found illusory in other cases? No, Your Honor. I think the difference is that this agreement stands on its own. The arbitration agreement does not make reference to of uh, the ability of the employer to change it. When you say the arbitration agreement, what are you referring to? I'm referring to that that page <laughs> in the handbook which sets out the agreement. Okay. Uh, and uh, where uh, is it? How, how do we know? So we only look at that page. You're saying that that page is the agreement. How That's do we know that argument. both parties agree to that agreement? Well, we know that the Do employer... we have to look somewhere else? We know that the employer agreed to it because the employer proffered it to the employee. He gave it to him and said, this is my policy. This is my offer. Do you accept? So the employer agreed to it. How do we know the employee agreed to it? Because what do we look 
because he signed the acknowledgement saying, I, I read it, understand it, I'm agreeing to it. And right above the employee's signature is the modification clause. Understood. I, un that I has... understand that. Okay. But, I but... think Judge Rushing actually had a question. <laughs> I did. I, I wanted to ask about, you keep mentioning the policies, procedures, and benefits, and that's what the modification clause says you can modify. Um, but it didn't look to me like, and I wanted to get your thoughts about, in the handbook, most things are not called policies, procedures, or benefits. There are some things that are called agreements, as you point out, but uh, most things don't have any one of those labels. So how do I how do I know, according to your theory, what is covered and what isn't covered by the modification clause? Well, a lot of the things are fairly you know, standard kinds of you know, dress codes and telephone courtesy and um, maternity leave, things like that. I think it's pretty clear from the from the phrase and the at the end of the acknowledgement clause that what it is talking about is benefits that are made available to the employee what your subject should yeah. say. You know, it says policies, procedures, or benefits can be changed, abolished, modified. Well, the, the full paragraph, I mean, the full sentence says, I further understand that the employer has the right from time to time to make and enforce new policies or procedures and to enforce, change, abolish, or modify existing policy procedures or benefits applicable to the employees as it may deem necessary with or without notice. It never says agreements. And these are there are four very important agreements that are set. But that's my that's my case. question. That so that's my question is uh, there are agreements in the handbook, uh, but there are a lot of things that aren't called policies or procedures or benefits. And you want to hang a lot of importance on the title of agreement, uh, but I I'm trying to correlate that with what's in the handbook under your argument. Well, my argument is that with respect to the agreements, the agreements are not subject to unilateral change by the employer because it doesn't say that they are. And Your Honor, I would I, I would like to you know refer the court to a case that we didn't talk about in our briefs, uh, but it came to my attention later. It's Ashford versus. Okay, Price wait. Did 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 you did you give this case you're about to talk about to opposing counsel? Yes, I did, Your Honor. Did you? Uh, but the court doesn't have it? Uh, no, unfortunately, I did not pick it up until getting ready to, to argue the case uh, just the other day. I sent Mr. Markovitz uh, an email telling him that I would rely on this case. It's a case that Judge Rushing sat on the panel. It was decided. Okay, well, that, go, go, go right ahead. But I would suggest that if you had time to send opposing counsel the case, which I commend you for, you would have had time to send it to the court as well. I didn't think it was appropriate as a 28 uh, G letter, Your Honor, because it, it came down in 2020 before we had briefed this. So okay. I didn't think it was really appropriate in that sense. But the case was Ashford versus Pricewaterhouse Coopers. And the very first sentence. Uh, What's says, the site for it? I'm sorry, 954 F3rd 678. It's a 2020 decision written by Judge Quattlebaum, uh, Judge Niemeyer, and Judge Rushing join. The Federal Arbitration Act expresses a strong policy in favor of arbitration. Based on that, the Supreme Court and our court have consistently held the contractual provisions capable of being reasonably read to call for arbitration should be construed in favor of arbitration. And the court went on to say <clears throat> that um, we reviewed de novo the enforceability of an arbitration provision and apply the strong federal policy in favor of enforcing those agreements. The FAA's policy of favoring arbitration agreements augments the ordinary rules of contract, of contract interpretation and requires all ambiguities to be resolved in favor of arbitration. I believe that Judge Gallagher's approach in this case did not comport with Ashford. That she essentially applied a, a summary judgment standard and said she was going to indulge all inferences in favor of the plaintiffs because we were in effect seeking summary judgment. That's not what a court should do under the Federal Arbitration Act. You should interpret the, the agreement 
consistent with the strong federal policy in favor of arbitration. And if there's any ambiguity at all, it should be construed in favor of arbitration. In this case, we have a reasonable interpretation of this agreement and the acknowledgement. How does we- that square? What? How does that square with the uh, ambiguity goes against the drafter? That of policy, a document. Right. That policy does not apply. That's what this court holds in effect in Ashford. That policy does not apply when you're construing an arbitration clause because of the Federal Arbitration Act and its strong policy. Well, counsel, to to give you the benefit of the presumption in favor of arbitrability, don't we have to first see that we have a valid contract, a valid agreement to arbitrate? Yes, and you do. But the, the reason that this is a valid agreement to arbitrate is that it's not an illusory promise. We made a promise, our our company made a promise that it would arbitrate. We had an affidavit from the general manager, Brandon Schaefer, who said it has always been our policy that we will arbitrate all employment disputes. This policy has been in effect since 2004. There has never been a court case where Nationwide took an employee to court. They have resolved each and every employment dispute through the uh, informal mediation process which has got the arbitration clause as part of that process if informal mediation fails. So this is a situation where this employer has always consistently applied the arbitration clause, has lived by it, has honored it, and these employees have refused to do so. Two of these employees- So, 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 so you, you, you made a, a statement in terms of the presumption in favor of arbitrability. That really goes more to the question of validity of the arbitration procedure, not to the scope of it. Isn't that correct? Uh, I think that uh, in in Ashford, what the court said is that it it goes towards the role of the court in interpreting what the contract means and whether the arbitration provision is valid as applied. In, in Ashford itself, it was a very unusual arbitration clause where Pricewaterhouse. So, so I want to make sure I said that right. The, the, the presumption applies to the scope of the agreement, not to the question of its validity. Uh, no, I don't think so, Your Honor. I, I think what an, 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 another passage from Ashford. Well, well check that out. While, while you're going to have a little time in rebuttal. I want you to check that out because I'm, that presumption is important. There is a differentiation in arbitration. And I think typically arbitration is properly applied when you interpret in the scope of the arbitration, you get that presumption, but when you're dealing with the validity of it, that's a different question. I think that the scope and is- In your fact, honor, I think I'm, you I'm, agreed when Judge Rushing raised that as well. Well, I agree that there has to be a valid agreement to arbitrate. I agree that you just can't impose a, you know, willy nilly upon an employee. But well, we want to get this whole concept of, of what you mean by the presumption in favor of arbitra- arbitration. That's that's a key point you're making there. And and here you've got this uh, acknowledgement statement that is a part, uh, to some extent, of this agreement. Uh, and it even says it. Um, I guess I guess if you don't sign that uh, uh, acknowledgement agreement, you don't have an op- you don't even have an agreement. Is that correct? If you don't sign the acknowledgement, do you have an agreement? I would think if the employee didn't sign the acknowledgement, he wouldn't have gone to work for the employer. <laughs> but the well, question is, do you have that, an that, agreement? That may follow, but the question, the question goes to whether you're going to have an arbitration agreement if, if he does work there, if he doesn't I sign think, it. <laughs> I think, Your Honor, to answer the question, I'll try to answer the question. In Hill versus PeopleSoft, we had a situation where there were two agreements. One was an arbitration agreement, and another was a policy or program that defined mediation, arbitration, and everything else. Well, respect- Hill had an arbitration agreement that would literally was a separate document. I mean, it was a separate document. Uh, this arbitration, uh, I mean, when, when you're dealing with arbitration not signed by anybody and expressly incorporating the acknowledgement, you got a different situation in Hill. Well, At least the trial judge felt so. <laughs> the, the trial judge felt so, but I don't think the trial judge's ruling is really consistent with Hill. Because in Hill, the, the IDS, that people saw had included the arbitration as part of it and said that the IDS program, <clears throat> uh, the employer reserved the right to change or, or modify without notice. 
So, okay, what we're gonna what we're gonna do at this point? Uh, I'm gonna ask the judges, do you have any further questions at this point? Otherwise, uh, we will we will let you come back as you've reserved time for rebuttal. Thank judges, you. anything further at this point? No. All right, we'll proceed on to hear from uh, the appellee in this case. Thank you, Judge Wayne. Uh, my, may it please the court, my name is Brian Markovitz, and we represent Mr. Cody and the other uh, salesmen that worked at Nationwide Motor Sales Corporation at their four car dealerships. Uh, Judge Gallagher got this correct. This matter falls clearly within Cheek versus United Healthcare, which has been good law by the Maryland Court of Appeals since 2003, and the subsequent cases relying upon Cheek. Uh, the district court did what it was supposed to do here. It decided whether a contract existed consistent with this court's Berkeley City uh, School District decision, and the district court Cheek, was correct. Cheek, Cheek was a federal district court case out of Maryland? No, Your Honor. Cheek was from the Maryland Court of Appeals. I have the other case, the Churdick case is what I'm looking at. Go ahead. Churdick is the district court of Maryland. That yeah. is correct. And it's Judge Schwong. Um, Your Honor, uh, the district court was correct. You must have a contract before compelling arbitration. Um, as Judge Rushing uh, just had a discussion about Ashford. Um, Ashford did not overturn the holding in Atkins versus Labor Ready. And I'll just quote that for, for the court. Even though arbitration has a favored place, there still must be an underlying agreement between the parties to arbitrate. Um, Mr. Murphy is, is putting um, what, and this is what the district court referred, referred to as the cart before the horse. Uh, you have to have an agreement to arbitrate first. Um, and I would also further note that when Mr. Murphy says that his client has never taken any steps uh, to, to get out of arbitration, uh, and that may be true, but Cheek also counsels that that doesn't matter. You look to what the agreement language says. And, and uh, frankly, if you could uh, um, focus on parties' actions as opposed to uh, what the language in a contract says, I mean, contract law would be kind of a mess. So, uh, you know, we would assert that that focus should be on the language here. Um, and the district court correctly found that there was no contract at all. Um, appellants are here and they did this in their pleadings and we also assert below, they're coming up with after the fact rationalizations to support their positions and, and what we believe is the tortured interpretation of the language that's in this agreement, um, which is evident by the questions that the members of this panel are asked previously. And well, on, on this whole business of whether you had a contract under the mutual consideration, this O'Neill case, uh, pretty strong case, and it's binding precedent on us. Uh, and some of the points you made, O'Neill went directly to address those. Uh, Your Honor, Your Honor O'Neill is a, is a pre cheat case that uh, apparently addressed South Carolina law, um, and it didn't deal with. Uh, actually, uh, in that case, and I'll, I'll just quote the court, it found multiple references in the AMI employee handbook, which indicated that there was an agreement to arbitrate. I would point the court to the joint appendix, which is at uh, 136, where the agreement is here, and paragraph one of the, of the arbitration provision. And appellants have conceded that that provision only covers employees' claims, only. That's conceded. And when you read this, this language here, it's I expressly agree, meaning the employee. It only covers employees' claims. And therefore, O'Neill is, is considerably different because there are multiple references in the employee handbook that indicated that the employer was, in fact, bound to the, to the agreement. We have no such thing here. Um, I, I would note that Mr. Murphy uh, just stated earlier, he referred to the aggrieved party in paragraphs two through four of, of this so-called agreement. It does not say aggrieved parties. It says aggrieved party, singular. And that's because the only party that can be file a, a claim in arbitration as conceded is from paragraph one. And therefore that is just the employee. So O'Neill is a completely different type of case. Um, certainly if this had bound and been mutual for both parties, we would we would have a different situation. We do not have that here, and that is not what this language says. Um, you know, I, I would also note that recognizing this problem, that appellants have gone and they're arguing a passive voice argument. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to be a, a linguistics expert, but let's giving them the benefit of the doubt, 
assume that there is some passive language in two through four, it still doesn't change the fact that paragraph one has set the universe of claims that exist in this agree this so-called agreement. And those are only the employees' claims that has been conceded by appellants. And there's no language in two, three, or four that expands the universe. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I, it sounds to me like you're you're arguing that unless the parties' rights are the same, they're not both agreeing to be bound. Can't they both agree to be bound by the agreement, even if one party has to arbitrate claims, but the other, you know, heck, doesn't have to arbitrate those particular claims. I'm not saying that's what this contract says, but uh, they don't have to have the same obligations. They both just have to be bound by the agreement. Your Honor, that I, I would agree with you, and I would assert that this agreement, um, you don't have to have the exact same uh, claims. I'm not, I'm not asserting that. Um, uh, what I'm stating is, is that there are no claims whatsoever that have to be presented at all by the, by the employer and that be, they do not have to uh, even go to arbitration. Um, the aggrieved party, uh, the, 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 the process is laid out in paragraphs two through four. The only obligation, the only obligation on behalf of appellant is stated in paragraph two, and that's in the pre-arbitration efforts. And that paragraph states, this is a quote, this is at appendix 136, the parties will then make a good faith effort to resolve any dispute covered by this agreement on an informal basis, whatever that means. Um, and I would point the court to a decision from Judge Blake, which is uh, very persuasive to this situation, which is Raglani versus Ripken Professional Baseball. Um, that's at 939 F sub 2D 523. And in that case, the, the agreement read very similar to what we have here. Um, the uh, Judge Blake found that it was one-sided, uh, onerous, it lacked consideration, and she noted that simply because the employer has a process for facilitating arbitration, that that is not uh, consideration. And so I, I, I would I would respectfully um, assert that there is there is no mutual mutuality of consideration. And I I know we're asking you questions about this, so it's totally appropriate for you to be talking about it. But I, the district court didn't decide this question, correct? I mean, she certainly focused more on on mutuality. I mean, on um, the revocation clause. Um, I, I do believe that she had some language in there about mutuality. Um, I would not say that was the focus of her case of her of her order, um, but she definitely focused much more on the uh, revocation clause. Um, and she certainly reserved on all the other issues. Um, she didn't. Well, if we if we rule in your favor that this um, is not a valid agreement because of the illusory language, do we need to reach the mutuality issue? We do not. That's correct, Your Honor. I, I, I mean, uh, obviously, if agreement's invalid for any reason, then uh, I, I, I well, I can't say <laughs> you'd have to to get to some of the other issues. You'd have to have a, a, some sort of uh, uh, agreement and maybe unconscionability. You'd have to reach another issue. But but with respect to, to the illusory promise, you would not have mutuality of consideration um, with the revocation clause. And therefore, you would not have to reach on mutuality. I mean, that would certainly uh, that would certainly not make it a valid agreement is under cheek. Um, so. Uh, what I would say here is that, um, you know, concluding on, on this, just to sort of, put, I guess, put a bow on this, to, uh, paragraphs two through four do not add any mutuality of consideration. Paragraph one is the, the universe of claims. Uh, the argument about passive voice does not change the fact that it, it, there's a grieved party, it's not parties, um, and therefore there's no mutuality of consideration. Um, I would, would uh, assert that this case is very similar to the Newhe versus Toll Brothers case from this court, which is from uh, uh, 2013. In that case, uh, there was only one party that was bound to the agreement. It was a, it dealt with buyers and sellers of, of mortgages. Um, one party had to follow certain procedures to initiate the arbitration process as here. 
uh, only one party could make claims covered by the arbitration, and the plain language only referenced claims by one party, the aggrieved party, which is, uh, again, the employee. And there was no consideration found by this court. I would also note that I think Newey's, in some ways, uh, was you know even worse than our, our case that we have here because Inouye at least stated that any and all disputes would go to arbitration and this court still held that there was not a mutuality of consideration. Um, as Judge uh, Wynn noted, uh, this case is not like Hill. Hill had a separate, uh, at least, let me touch on this for mutuality of consideration. In that case, on its face, it required both parties to arbitrate. And I'll, I'll touch on, um, uh, the revocation clause in a second here. Um, finally, uh, Your Honor, as you mentioned, Chertak. I think Chertak, um, which is a district court case from Judge Swang, is 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 very uh, important in that um, it's very persuasive because there were actually two agreements in that case. There weren't one. Appellant keeps talking about one agreement, but there were actually two. And one and one of the agreements, there was one that applied to only the test takers of the ACT, and there was another one that was a general arbitration provision. And this case very much illustrates the way these this this goes with mutuality of consideration. The one that had only applied to the test takers, Judge Schwong found was invalid for want of, of consideration. There was not mutuality. However, the one that was a general provision that was uh, applied to all the claims except save a few between the test takers and ACT, he found that one was- Speak, that, speak, to, the, speak um, to the illusory issue that's before us here. Uh, thank and, you, Arne. And this language and, and reference in particular the arguments that your opposing counsel made. Sure. So um, I, I think the important thing here to acknowledge, and, and Judge Wynn, you, you, you sort of hit the nail right on the head here, which is, I mean, you know, this is like the old main saying, you can't get there from here. The, the problem that appellants have is that they have to have this acknowledgement receipt in order to have some sort of agreement on paragraphs one through four. And the acknowledgement receipt, um, Mr. Cody's is at, at the appendix at 171. But the problem is, is that they have this reservation of rights clause that, um, you know, clearly applies to the six bullet points above. Um, and so in order to get some sort of acknowledgement that the employees in fact got this agreement and read it and signed off on it, they have to refer to the acknowledgement receipt and these two documents actually refer to each other. And, and again, that revocation clause is right below. Um, the appellants are trying to make this distinction between an agreement and a policy. And I guess now at, at argument here, they're talking about benefits. Um, but when you look at the language here, and as Judge, Judge Gallagher correctly found, there's nothing in the language here that indicates that agreements, these are four separate agreements. In fact, the handbook says it's intended as a reference source regarding these policies, procedures, and benefits. And, and let's be clear, I mean, no one on this Zoom call, for instance, would, would draft an agreement uh, or the acknowledgement this way if agreements were supposed to be outside of the revocation clause you would have at least some language in here that would state something to the effect of uh, the four bullet points above the state as an agreement or not. Uh, the revocation clause does not apply to this section. Uh, you would either maybe have them in a separate heading or a separate uh, separate section. And none of that is present here. The, the, the average reader looking at this or just a legal reader as well would never look at this and say, oh, four of these six bullet points are not included in, in as being applied for the revocation clause. Um, and the revocation clause reads almost exactly like cheek. And so we would assert that this is an after the fact uh, creation or rationalization to try to justify uh, something else than what this agreement says, this acknowledgement. And that the court uh, has to look at this in order to even get to, uh, to arbitration. Um, uh, the court's indulgence, one second. Um, with respect to Hill versus PeopleSoft, which which appellant is is citing, um, I, I think that case is almost, in some ways, the reverse of our situation. You had in Hill, you had this program, this IDS program, and Hill Hill, this court noted at least twice in there that 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 IDS program did not contain a signature, and so the fact that an offer letter referred to it being 
uh, incorporated. It was separate and outside of the actual arbitration agreement. Here, in order to even get to the the employee having knowledge, you have a signed document, which is the acknowledgement receipt. And then on top of it, it's in the employee manual that also says in conclusion and has this very similar revocation clause. So that, that case is, is, is essentially uh, essentially the opposite of what we had have here. Um, I would assert that this, this case is very much like two district court opinions, uh, one by Judge uh, Bennett and another by Judge Grimm, which I think that it's very persuasive, should be very persuasive for the court. One is Kyer versus Conifer Valued Based Care, LLC. That's at 982 F sub 2D 582. That is a district court of Maryland case. And in that case, Mr. Kyer received an employee handbook with the so-called arbitration clause. There was an acknowledgement receipt that contained a revocation of rights. Um, and Judge Bennett held that it was illusory based upon that revocation of rights clause contained in the acknowledgement receipt. Similarly, uh, Judge Grimm, in an unpublished decision, Brent versus Priority One Auto Group, which is at 2016, uh, Lexus 193735, which is from Judge Grimm in 2016, similarly had a, a situation where there was an acknowledgement receipt um, and, and it also contained a revocation of, of, of rights clause referencing back to the so-called arbitration. And at the end, in that employee manual, there was also a revocation clause that seems very square uh, to our case as well. And he held that that was also an illusory promise and therefore no uh, consideration. Um, I just would like to just very briefly conclude uh, by saying that, uh, you know, it's our belief there's no mutuality. Um, and that there's a uh, revocation clause makes this illusory and therefore there is no agreement. The presumption of arbitrability does not apply unless you have an agreement and uh, that the, this court should affirm the district court's ruling uh, to the extent that the uh, this court uh, does not believe that the district court should be affirmed. Uh, we believe that the relief that is being um, suggested by appellants is was incorrect because um, as noted earlier, there are certain issues that have not uh, necessarily been addressed by the district court, such as statute of limitations, unconscionability, and possibility, and therefore the proper remedy should this court not agree with the district court is to uh, remand it with instructions to address those issues because they were never addressed by the district court and therefore not before this court. Um, I will reserve on the rest of my time unless uh, any of the panel has any other questions. All right. Well, thank you. I I don't know what you mean by reserve it, but well, that would be the end of your time for today. Uh, I guess, I guess so. Uh, do, you, you. Uh, do you have any further questions, uh, judges, before we proceed? Uh, thank yeah. you, Mr. Mark. We'll, uh, right, thank you. Mr. Murphy, you have just a few minutes, uh, if you will. You, you may proceed. I had to get myself unmuted. Sorry, Your Honor. Uh, um, <laughs> So let me talk about three things. One, on mutuality. Uh, obviously, the judge did not rule on it, and, and rightly so. The, the, the paragraph, the first paragraph that Mr. Markowitz refers to says, I expressly agree that any claim that arises out of or relates to my employment or termination of my employment must be resolved through final and bonding arbitration. That's the passive voice language that creates a mutual obligation. The employer has given the employee this document. The employee says, I agree, all claims arising out of my employment must be resolved through final and binding arbitration. That's mutual. I sort of read that. I thought that might be one of the weaker points you'd make if you want to reference that paragraph. There are some others well, in there that seem to have uh, not be the first person pronoun, but that I in there, uh, I thought that was maybe I read it wrong, but I thought that was probably the weaker point. You would you you wouldn't focus on that. Well, but I got your point. I think you're trying to broaden it out to say that it's it it is in context of something else. And maybe that's it's 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 all mutual as reflected in the in the other paragraphs, Your Honor, because the other paragraphs paragraphs do refer to an aggrieved party, whichever party that might be, and the parties, in in paragraph three. I'm sorry, in paragraph two. Now, with respect to the, the clause at the end of the acknowledgement, 
I think that what, what Judge Gallagher failed to recognize is that there are, as I've said, four agreements contained in this document. One of them is the agreement by the employee not to misuse a customer's credit information because car salesmen get all sorts of credit information, banking information, all sorts of information about a customer's assets. This agreement says you will not misuse that. Now, that's re that agreement is now being rendered illusory, according to Judge Gallagher, because of this clause at the end of the acknowledgement. There's another agreement about not violating the telemarketing policies, which are set by federal law. There's another agreement that says you should not misuse your demonstrator vehicle. You shouldn't use it to commit a crime. Now, these are all agreements that these employees have made, which are, according to Judge Gallagher's opinion, rendered illusory by this admittedly awkward phrase at the end of the acknowledgement. But an awkward phrase or a lack of clarity does not dictate that there is no agreement because again I go back to Ashford and what Ashford said on that point is while the language of the agreement at issue is admittedly not a model of clarity we do not review it with a clean slate the FAA and our precedent tip the scales decidedly in favor of arbitration since the reading advanced by Price Waterhouse is a reasonable interpretation of the language agreed to by the parties we must construe the agreement to permit the arbitration of Ashford's Title VII claims. In like fashion, the interpretation that we have, that, that, that clause about changing policies does not apply to these agreements, which the, which the employee has said, I agree to be bound by this. I'm not gonna misuse the telemarketing. I'm not gonna misuse the customer's confidential information. I'm not gonna misuse your demonstrator. All of those agreements I have a question agreements. from Judge Judge Russian has a question for you, Mr. Murphy. I believe you do, Judge. Please. Yep. Judge Russian, can you hear me? You I think you're muted. Judge Russian, I think you are muted at this point. I think she's happened. looking for alternate technology, but she'll come back eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Where's our tech person? Yeah. Jackie? We're looking through the Polycon settings now to see if we can assist Judge Rushing. Thank you.
Murphy, before you left? I did not. I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't hear him anymore. So I wanted to let you know. I see, I see. I see. Well, Mr. Murphy, if you want to just go ahead and take another minute or so and conclude, that'll be fine. Uh, I would like the court reporter to read back what I said so that Judge Rushing has the ability to. We wish, it. we wish we were in that setting for you, but you're going to have to go on memory on this one. <laughs> no, I, I was just making the point that uh, I think Ashford really resolves this issue about reasonable interpretations. If there is a reasonable interpretation that makes the arbitration agreement valid and binding, that's the interpretation that this court should reach. I think that's what Ashford said. And I think that's, and that is what we are saying, that there is a reasonable interpretation. It might not be a model of clarity because these things are done by employers. And this one was done 16 years ago, but it's been followed, it's been adhered to, and if there is a reasonable interpretation that makes this arbitration clause binding. And with that, I, I thank the court. Look forward to the day when we can all shake hands at the end of the arts way. As do we, as do we. Uh, that is something normally we would do. And hopefully post COVID, once we are clear, we can resume that tradition that's, I believe is unique to our court in so many ways and something we relish is the opportunity to be with you. So thank both of you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Markovich for being with us today. And uh, we will take your case in environment on advisement in light of your great arguments. So we'll move to the last case of the day. Um, judges, would you like to take a Asset versus DXC. If that is the case, then that should be Mr. Levin over there. And are you prepared to proceed, Mr. Levin? I am prepared, Your Honor. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity do, to uh, <laughs> speak to you all today. May it please the court. Good afternoon. I am Greg Levin with the law firm of Motley Rice, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And we are serving as co lead counsel here for the punitive class. This is an appeal of the dismissal of the securities fraud complaint on the basis of the mere pleadings alone. Over the last 12 years, this court has had occasion, several occasions actually, to remind litigants in lower courts that the determination of whether a claim is plausible is a context specific inquiry that should be guided by common sense and judicial experience. This court also in Yates, along with other courts of appeal actually, have also held that in assessing Sienter allegations holistically, the inferential weight according to any specific discrete set of allegations should also be guided by common sense. We respectfully submit that that common sense reading of the complaint is absent from the district court's um, opinion. Let me so start let, let by- Let me make sure I understand where you're going with the common sense. I would agree, I wish it was at least my idea, but you do have the uh, Private Security Litigation Reform Act that imposes a heightened pleading requirement here. Absolutely. So I, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to throw you off, but I'm just, no. I, I, I like to speak in good terms, but common sense isn't always what you're going to get out of that <laughs> if it's well, a heightened pleading requirement. Well, th that's true, Your Honor. But again, you know, the, the specific facts need to be read in a common sense perspective. Let me, let me give an Great. example. Relative, relevant to this case. Defendant Lowry was the architect of the cost-cutting or so-called workforce optimization strategy. He was narrating a, quarter, a quarterly update, in fact, more than that, regarding the success or alleged success of that strategy. Okay. If you have a senior executive out there speaking, investors, case law says investors have a right to justifiably rely upon what senior executives are telling them. So with that background, if you're making specific statements about how wonderful things are within your organization, there are common sense inferences that arise from that scenario. One, if you're making specific statements, logically you could be expected to have knowledge of the issues at hand. Otherwise, um, Investors would be able to justifiably rely, but the case law says they can. 
And he would so be you're focusing, are you focusing in this instance, there are a couple of issues here, at least from what I see it, uh, Center is one and then material misrepresentations or omissions. Yes. And address this Sienta aspect of this first. Okay, I, 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 absolutely. Where I was going with my hypothetical was that it would be absurd to suggest that one does not have knowledge when one is making continual, repeated, specific statements about an issue. So we start with that part of the syllogism. I think the most important place I'd like to start at Sienna is motive. Now, motive isn't required, uh, but it sure helps. That's a, the synopsis of what the Supreme Court has said. Um, you've got a lot of insider trading here. Now, insider trading can be suspicious for a whole host of reasons. It could be suspicious because it's a large amount. It could be suspicious because it's ill or suspiciously timed. We've got both of those things here. You've got two executive defendants, one who sold 17% of their holdings during a nine-month class period, one who sold 77% of their holdings during a nine-month class period. Uh, we've, we, I would submit we've cited the cases that show that 17 and 17, 77% are significant. District Court disagreed. Uh, I think that was a, an erroneous conclusion, particularly when viewed uh, in light of the suspicious timing. Now, what happens? Mid-August, there's a media report about poor relation, uh, poor um, operations within the delivery group, which is the largest group in the company, the one that's responsible for contract performance. What do the defendants do? They go into damage control mode, they start contacting analysts, and they try to get a positive spin out to the public, which they do. They engage Evercore. Evercore puts out a report on September 5th. So you've got a bad media report on August 17th. 19 days later, there's a positive analyst report. What happens? The defendants go out and start immediately selling stock. Not insignificant shares of stock. For defendants select, it's a humongous chunk of that, of, of, of his holdings. Okay. So you've got, you've got timing and you've got amount. Now, what did the district court say? District court said, well, we're gonna rely on three things. We're gonna rely on the fact that, you know, 17 and 77% isn't a lot. I would submit the case law says otherwise. But more, more to the point, um, he also said, well, defendant Salah, if you compare the eight, nine month class period to the nine months before, he sold more during the control period. I will grant the district court that that conclusion was correct. However, he made no finding. Well, say, if it's correct, that's that's pretty powerful, well, isn't it? You know, uh, you got to give <laughs> everybody their due, and and that that in and of itself is a correct statement. I can't quibble with the math. What I can quibble with is that you can't pick and choose. If you're going to say that, well, I'm going to find persuasive the fact that Salah sold more in the nine months before. And in the, then in the nine months of the class period, what do you do with Lowry? He sold nothing during the control period and sold all the shares during the class period. I would submit you can't have it both ways. Now, the reason I don't think so. That, that, so just just so I make sure I understand uh, sure. where we are with all this, your response in regard with respect to Judge Wynn's question about Center is this whole timing and, and motive. Well, that's not going the entirety of it. I think it's an important chunk of it. Uh huh. Do you do you uh, uh do you concede that any of the thirty eight statements about which you complain are forward looking statements? Certainly, some of them are forward looking. I, not many of them, but there are a few. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, so, Ron. can you uh, list for me one that is forward looking, and then tell me uh, how I, I the appellees had actual knowledge? I don't have one that it was false. I'm looking. Okay, well, I, you know, it's, sorry, it's, I, I don't have I don't have a specific example of the whole statement, but, but I can address the safe harbor, and then I'll go back to the to the insider trading. On the safe harbor, where it all comes down to is there are two independent prongs, as 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 this court and the statute make clear. There is the is there meaningful cautionary language, and was the statement made with actual knowledge? And for us to prevail on forward looking statements, we have to prevail on both of those readily admit that the problem with the district court's approach and with the briefing filed by the defendants is that that presumes that the universe of facts relevant to those prongs don't overlap 
If there was a Venn diagram, there would be an overlap between, logically, between those two, um, between those two problems. Let me tell you what I mean. If you look I need at the, a Venn diagram, actually, in this case. I'm sorry? I'd like a diagram. I um, said I would like a diagram in this case. <laughs> uh, if I had known that in advance, Your Honor, I would have, <laughs> um, I would, I would have, I would have provided one. But, but I might have gotten you a field of Judge Wynn's question. I didn't want to. I'm sorry to interrupt your question, it, Judge Wynn, or the response to it. If you no, wanted I, I, to follow I think, up, I, I think at least, and I want you to tell me if I'm looking at this case correctly. You've got two uh, essential categories under 10B you're looking at. One is CNN, one is misrepresentation. We can bounce back and forth on it, but that gets a little confusing. And I was asking you to deal with Sienta, and I looked at what you did, and it looks like you have about five categories that you mm -hmm. list out. You you just hit the one right down inside of trading, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so you got five categories. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to deal with those five here and amplify as to why that they're that there, when you go okay. to the misrepresentation business, uh, you won't get there if you don't win on Sienta. So we ask you. If, 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 if you uh, if, if there's not there, you won't have to deal with misrepresentation at all. Uh, so I, I think that, the, the, right. the, the challenge you have is under those five is to let us is to direct us to which one of those you think well your strongest one. And I'm taking that that you think that inside a trader one is I is, do think is, the inside is, trading is, 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 is the strongest strong. one. Um, okay. And, and, and it, I, I I don't want to dwell on too much because I'm I'm obviously down around five minutes, but. The district court talked a lot about trading plans. The problem here is that the trading plan wasn't in the record. Now, the defendants chose to, as you will see from the size of the joint appendix, to submit dozens and dozens of exhibits. They didn't submit the trading plan. I have no idea when the trading plan. You're talking about that 10B51 plan yes, that uh, you put it out predetermined. I mean, it's, it's right there. Cases have used that. Uh, a absolutely, but 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 what where the cases have what have, the nuance is the plans were in the record. It, you know, if we could see the plan and we would know when the plan was adopted, whether the plan was discretionary or non-discretionary to be to get benefit of the defense, it needs to be non-discretionary. We don't know. There's a First Circuit case, Boston Scientific, it's cited in our briefing, which basically holds that look, you know, could it be a defense? Absolutely, could be a defense. Do we know it's a defense here? No, because the, the plan is not in the record. I mean, this is akin to the rule that, you, that this court has established alongside many others, that um, when you move to dismiss on the basis of an affirmative defense, the affirmative defense needs to appear on the face of the complaint or in the documents of which this court can take judicial notice. If the plan is so, in so the record, the fact that, but the fact that, that you have the plan, and there seems to be a plan, okay, maybe it's not dispositive, but, but you, you do admit that having a plan in place that we all agree they actually use would only may not know the timing or whatever it weakens that inference of a fraudulent purpose does not i'm not i'm not going to concede to that your honor i think boston scientific which is the closest um, case at the appellate level on this issue would actually help the other way which is that it can be but we can't make that finding and nor should the district court have made that finding without those critical facts now, so which um, of those me, other categories do you think is strong? You've, you've okay. given us the inside of trading. Let's, what, what's let's the other one? With, you? Okay, let's start with um, access or knowledge of information directly contrary to the defendant's statement. Let's talk a little bit about Stephen Hilton. As you know, he's, his name figures prominently in the complaint. He was the head of the delivery division, the largest. Is this the division. core, the, your core operations uh, 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 category? Uh, well, no, this core operations would be the, was, was where I was going after Stephen Hilton. Okay, that's words, why I want to make sure access to information okay. would fall before Stephen Hilton. So, so with Stephen Hilton, he he filed a breach of contract action. His allegations are incorporated in the complaint. He says I told Defendant Lowry that the pace of cuts were affecting customer satisfaction, and then shortly thereafter, Defendant Lowry goes out and tells the public all is well in the delivery division. Those allegations from, from, from Stephen Hilton are corroborated by various former employee accounts, and so those two merge together. The next thing would be core operations. Core operations was not even addressed. If you search for the word core in the district court opinion, you're not going to find it because it's not there. They say a key area has to do with 
the the uh, the the the, the uh, investment in employees. Now, I'm a firm believer that when you use the word of ordinary um, um, in an ordinary manner, it should get an ordinary meeting. So I went in preparing for this. I went on uh, thesaurus.com. Key the word key for key area. Key means essential. Key means paramount. Um, when something is a key area, there is with that a presumption that that the uh, people in the senior most uh, positions know what's going on, and that's buttressed by the fact that that again, both of these defendants were the architects of the policy that we're talking about. And then lastly, there's this notion of of temporal proximity. You've got that negative um, report in the media, August 17th. Shortly thereafter, the company reaffirms guidance. Two months later, they start ratcheting it back. Common sense, going back to where I started, common sense will tell you that things do not go to hell in a handbasket overnight. These problems build up over time. And so courts have held that when there's like a three to six month period between is a four percent sorry I'm sorry yes is a is a four percent correction uh going to hades in a handbasket it no. it seems if like you, your your timing point really depends on the significance of the change doesn't it not necessarily not, I, I don't think it's that factor alone and you know we could start playing percentages um you know would i rather have somebody on my baseball team who was one for two batting 500 or would I rather have somebody who's, um, you know, 28 for a hundred who's batting 280? Well, the, the second guy is not, his batting average is lower, but he's had more experience and more doing it. It's, it's a contextual thing. It's a materiality um, um, analysis. And this court has said that in most cases, materiality is not something we're going to determine on the basis of the pleadings alone. I right. Don't think that's not here. my, that's yeah, that's not my point. My point is just your, you're trying to suss something out of the timing that there's we can infer scienter in part from the timing um and i'm just pointing out your timing allegation depends on the significance right you a company doesn't fall apart in a few months but you might make well, minor adjustments based on new findings within a few months that it weakens the inference no well you know other than the fact that the the total dollar volume involved and we, this is in our brief and the math is in there as well it was like a billion dollars when you when you when you put all the numbers on the table it's a billion dollars now that may only be four percent but i think investors would find a billion dollar uh disparity to be to be um to be significant and and we cite the cases in our brief about gross disparities between prediction and fact and so on as being uh, relevant to the Sienna analysis. And, and I would submit that you can't just look at percentages and percentages alone. And I see that I've gone over, um, uh, unless the court has any questions for me, um, I have uh, reserved some rebuttal time and we'd be happy to answer further questions then. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Judges, Thank you very you much. Have further questions this time, or not, we'll move to hear from uh, the appellee. And if you will pronounce your last name, because I'm curious as to whether you pronounce it like mine or is it like that stuff we drink? It's like the stuff we drink. So I'm not trying to pass uh. judgment on which is better, but I, I happen to like my last name. <laughs> All right. Uh, may it please the court, Jamie Wine of Latham and Watkins on behalf of <clears throat> appellees. Um, I was going to start talking about uh, material misstatements because I don't think, um, as the district court found, that they have sufficiently pled those. But given where the questions um, have focused, why don't I start with Sienta, the other basis for the district yeah, court? Yeah, focus ruling. on the Sienta and, and look at the five categories that uh, Mr. Um, uh, Levin has is, is, is set forth, and particularly the ones that he discussed, starting with insider okay. trading. Absolutely. On the insider trading, um, as has been referenced, uh, the court did look at that. The court did not think that the trading was suspicious, um, either in terms of timing, uh, given the fact that Mr. Soleil had sold um, more stock in the control period prior to the class period, um, and or an amount, and in particular looking at Mr. Lowry's, given that he only traded 17%. 
And importantly here, you know, are the uh, Rule 10b-51 trading plans, they are referenced in public filings, they're non-discretionary trading plans. The reason they're not part of the record on appeal is that the, the plans themselves were not in any public filing. So on a motion to dismiss, we were all trying to um, look strictly at just what was in the pleadings and what was in the public record. So the fact of the plan is in the record, but the plans themselves aren't. We think that's fine. When you look at decisions like Yates, which is a circuit court for circuit opinion, um, it says it's quite appropriate to consider the existence of trading plans, even if they're entered into after the class period started. So whether it's before the class period or after the class period, they are relevant. They might hold more weight under certain circumstances, but they're still relevant to when you're looking at whether these executives were purposely trying to manipulate results, you know, according to trading that they were doing. Here, the trading was pre-planned. They didn't have discretion over it. And it certainly factors into the analysis when you look at Center. Um, the second thing that um, was mentioned today was the allegations of Steve Hilton. Um, these come up both in Center and they're relevant if we're going back to the misstatement analysis. But for purposes of, of Center, you know, they really focused in their complaint on Hilton's employment complaint, which they just crib for purposes of their securities complaint. They didn't do any independent investigation of that. So we just have the allegations that are in the Hilton complaint and the termination letter that's referenced in that complaint. But even just looking at those allegations on their face, his, his allegations do not support the contention that DXC's actual cost cutting was causing problems at DXC, much less that those problems were known to defendants. To the contrary, when you look at that Hilton complaint, what he was alleging is that the costs implemented in his delivery division were in fact instrumental in the remarkable increases in earnings per share that DXC experienced in the first five quarters after the merger. And he says in his own complaint that these cost cutting measures were implemented with minimal negative impact to service quality. That's in his own allegations. His disagreement with Mr. Lowry in his in his wrongful termination suit is were about additional proposed cuts that DXC never actually implemented. They were purely internal goals, um, and Hilton alleges only that he thought those theoretical or aspirational goals for cutting even more might have a detrimental effect on the company's performance. But the whole premise of his employment complaint is that everyone knew the cost cutting, cost reduction targets, the internal ones were just aspirational and not implemented or ever meant to be implemented. So plaintiffs are taking those allegations out of context and they're saying something that's actually the opposite of what Hilton himself says in his employment complaint. The termination letter, the letter terminating Hilton, likewise fails to support plaintiff's claims here. Plaintiffs argue that the letter shows that Hilton was terminated because of the poor performance of his delivery division. But again, Hilton says the opposite. The whole thesis of his suit is that he and his division performed very well and that he shouldn't have been fired. And therefore, his termination was unjustified. When you look at the letter, and it's in the record, the particular criticisms outlined in the termination letter are very personal and specific to Mr. Hilton. They're not about the delivery division as a whole. The letter says that he failed to achieve internal cost-cutting goals, that he failed to personally develop a strong relationship with a large client, and that he engaged in insubordinate conduct, which undermined company morale. Those are the reasons that are, that are outlined in the letter for his termination. Again, very specific to him and not about the, the delivery division as a whole. Um, as to the core operations theory, just saying that um, statements related to core operations cannot alone establish scienter. Defendants, plaintiffs would still have to show that defendants had actual exposure to information contradicting their statements about core operations. And plaintiffs have just failed to do that here. Yates talks about this. I commend you to look at the Yates decision because I think it's very important on a lot of these issues. Um, the doctrine, the cooperation's doctrine, really only applies when it would be absurd to suggest that management didn't know of an issue. 
Um, and here, plaintiffs are trying to suggest that there were very specific things going on that were impacting the performance that weren't disclosed to the market, and they're just assuming that management knew. None of their allegations, including their former, former employee allegations, show this. They don't tie anything specific to what defendants actually knew, and so I, I don't think that holds water. Uh, temporal proximity. Again, we're just talking about a 4% reduction in the projections. They came out three months after um, the first quarter of 19 earnings were released. So you had a three month time period, not a three week time period, like a lot of the cases that plaintiff site have. And what's really important to keep in mind here is that it's not a typical case of securities fraud where defendants were then trying to like hide this from the market. They had the merger. They had a very successful fiscal year 18 where they met all of their goals and revenue projections. They then uh, projected out for 19 a little bit more modestly. They met those goals in the first quarter of 19. And then they hit some bumps in the road for second quarter of 19. And they immediately disclosed those to the public. They immediately disclosed them. They said the reasons why they thought they were having execution problems and they told the market. That is just not a case of securities fraud. Um, you know, you know what's interesting here is these are uh, proving Sienta is a difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, listening to what's going on here because when you're looking at uh, the Sienta requirement, you can go either intentional or reckless. Interesting enough, reckless looked like to me that really would be all but impossible to do. Uh, but the intentional aspect of it, you then look at it in a holistic way, and you and you sort of get the feeling of this is a really hard thing to do here uh, because of given that just the, I guess the innocent presumption when you're looking at that comparative with the requisite one, it, uh, which is an interesting comparative way of looking at this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it, it, it just seems to me, particularly with the way Congress has moved this, uh, uh, it's really skewed in a way so that you really can't bring these unless you have something pretty solid. I'm almost wondering what does it take uh, once you list five different categories, and then we go through each one, and basically what you've uh, uh, concluded is uh, is that there's a weakening of this inference of, of, of a possible of an inference on purpose uh, as a result of that, and then you look at them collectively in a holistic way, and you get the broad whole idea that well the presumption in, at least the the innocence uh, inference uh, is seems to be a little bit more compelling than the requisite one on it, and then. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the game. Uh, and, and I just wonder, uh, because you guys are the experts on this, uh, you know, we, we, we are experts on everything, of course, but uh, really you're the true ones who, who do these cases. And uh, uh, in, in terms of, of, of bringing a case like this, I mean, what, what is it a plaintiff, what, what do they have to do? It makes me, makes me wonder. Yeah. Uh, and un, under these particular facts where there is definitely something going on here, I mean, and but that's not enough, to, you know, to, to get you there. I, I grant you that, but there's something going on when, you know, you got you do have some trading going back over, and I got, understand there's a plan. And you, and he says maybe you shouldn't use. You say you should, uh, and then you got all the the other the cooperation matter that comes up, and the and 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 and, and other uh, uh, matters on the uh, elements of the Sienda that 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 he contends a, creates a problem. But when you come down to it. Um, I'm just finding it's really kind of hard uh, um, to bring these cases, and you probably don't disagree with that, do you? <laughs> Look, it's a, it's a high standard, and I want to address everything that it, it, you know comes in with your question. So let me just acknowledge it is a high standard. I think there's a reason that the high standard was put into the PSLRA, and it's exactly for cases like this. We we say there's a lot going on here. Well, actually, what's going on is that there was just a miss in terms of the revenue projections, right? There was an unexpected business setback. That that happens, stocks can drop, investors can be upset, and you can see that reflected in the stock price. That doesn't mean that there's been securities fraud. So really there is a heightened standard, particularly on Scienter, to show securities fraud. And just to review a little bit about, it's not just the circuit, right? The Supreme Court in Telebs has said that you know you really have to have a strong inference that defendants intentionally or recklessly deceive, manipulated, defraud investors. Um, there has to be a cogent and compelling inference of fraudulent intent. That inference, this is also in Talib's, 
must be at least as compelling as any opposing non-fraudulent uh, intent inference. Um, and so it, it is definitely a high standard. Now you asked, you know, what, what could they do? Well, we do have lots of cases where the scienter bar is met, right? You could have trading that's not according to a plan. You could have trading where the executives are just deciding on their own when to buy, when to sell, at what prices. It could be very suspicious when you look at the patterns in terms of statements they were making and timing of their sales. Um, you, you could have um, restatements of financials, right? And an actual finding after the fact that what they were telling the public was actually wrong. We don't have anything like that here. There's, there's no allegation that anything they actually said in terms of reported results was wrong. We have no restatement. We have no auditors coming in and saying what's going on here and questioning the executives. So we really don't have any of the indicia of scienter that you might typically see. And, and something that I mentioned earlier as well, here we have a company literally the first quarter that the that the looked like you know they weren't going to perform the way they thought they were going to perform came out and told the public a lot of times you have them trying to hide it trying to you know mask things not be transparent with the public and i think all of that is really important here to to show that in fact there is not a stronger inference of fraudulent intent that you have to conclude on this. Let me record. ask you uh, regarding that inside trading uh, category that was mentioned. Uh, yep. Do we know when those individual defendants entered into their uh, Rule 10 B51 stock uh, plans? Um, I happen to know it's not in the record. I'm happy to give you that answer if you want, but it's it's not in the record because it's not public. I can tell you the answer, and then I can tell you why I think it doesn't matter either way um, no we don't need to know it if it's not in the record that <laughs> so, probably so, won't help us here so let um, me just emphasize I just want, again uh, that, that's probably the question i want to make sure it's not in the record it's, it, we, we didn't miss that is that the correct when, the when is not in the record but could i just emphasize again that whether it was before the class period or shortly at the start of the class period that even according to yates and other decisions it can still be relevant to the analysis right so it, it can be relevant in terms of these were pre-planned. They weren't making decisions on their own as you go through the class period about when they were going to trade. So I think it can but be But it would make a difference way. if it was ended into during the class period, right? Uh, it depends. I mean, if it was at the outset of the class period, but before most of the statements were made, then that's going to be more relevant than if it were, you know, later in the class period. Okay. Um, right. Again, I, I've, I've mentioned I've mentioned Yates. Um, it's a Fourth Circuit decision. I would I would really, um, like I said, commend you to to look at it. it this, this might just emphasize the challenges, Judge Wynn, that that you're um, that you're observing. But there in Yates, there were multiple restatements of the company's financial statements. There were former employees who had direct access to individual defendants and made allegations about specific meetings and documents pointing to the individual defendants and their knowledge of the issue that caused the restatements in that case. Um, there was allegations in that case that the independent auditor had alerted the defendants to the issue. There was stock trading by six insiders with one um, trading as much as 80% of his shares, selling as much as 80% of his shares. And still the Fourth Circuit found that any inference of fraudulent intent could not overcome the more compelling inference of good faith conduct. You know, here, as I've said, we would argue that the non-fraudulent intent is overwhelmingly more plausible. It's, it's simply not plausible and certainly not equally plausible that an inference of non-fraudulent intent that defendants would intentionally mislead their investors about DXE's business plan only to reveal the truth a few months later. There's just no reason that they would do that. Um, and, 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 you know, as I've said, the non-fraudulent inference here is exceedingly plausible and consistent with the facts, given the performance in fiscal 2018, given the performance in the first quarter, quarter of fiscal 19, and the fact that they came out right, you know, at the start of the second quarter of, at, right in the second quarter of 19 and, and told the public about the issues. And then even still only reduced their revenue forecast by, by 4%. So we think on Scienter, it's just a clear winner under Fourth Circuit law. I'm happy to address, you know, the the misstatements and, and the fact that many of them um, are forward-looking statements and puffery, which are protected. 
Um, I don't know that we need to on the record, and I think we fully briefed it, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if, if you all want to get into that now during argument. We do have your briefs on it, and the hope briefs are very thorough. Uh, I'll ask the judges, do you have any further questions of Ms. Wine? I don't. There being none, thank you. Uh, okay, Ms. Thank Levin, you, you have a few minutes. You need to unmute yourself. You, you uh, oh, I'm, right. I'm sorry. Th um, <laughs> you, when you discuss the, the burden that plaintiff's lawyers have, you've just described the last 17 years of my life. Uh, it does make it challenging. <laughs> it makes it very, very interesting. And I still get excited every day to wake up to go to work to do this. Um, well, to your credit, you're still doing it. So it might be um, something good about it. <laughs> um, much to my wife's chagrin, yes, there is. Uh, I'm still doing it. Um, but but what, what, there's a lot packed into uh, my my uh, esteemed colleague's presentation. Let me correct a couple of things. Uh, council said that DXC immediately disclosed the problem. They didn't immediately disclose the problem. Um, after the negative article in August, they tried to court analysts, and then they went ahead and traded stock. So it's not quite as innocent as saying it immediately disclosed. But look, the burn is very high, but it's not insurmountable. And I think that, that it's worth saying, one, the Supreme Court in Tel Aviv, alongside the comparative analysis that uh, was involved in the discussion you just had, it said no smoking gun is required. So I don't need to have the videotape. I don't need to have uh, an admission to a, uh, to a criminologist or anything like that. Uh, so again, it's not insurmountable. And there's no need for us to prove Sienna. We only have to plead a strong inference, not prove anything. Um, but let me go back to um, the district court's opinion, which is why we're all here. There's a statement in his opinion, it's a JA 594, about what it is plaintiffs need to do at this stage. The statements, he says, must be both actually false and misleading, and defendants must know that those statements are so. Okay. Well, with regard to the statements being actually false and misleading, with the exception of the, of the forward-looking ones, the non-forward-looking ones, don't need to be actually false or misleading at the pleading stage. This court in Hunter applied a reasonable belief standard. You can look for reasonable belief in the lower court standard. It's missing. And this court has acknowledged in, in, in Triangle Capital, and Judge Wynn, I know you were on that panel, that severe recklessness suffices to plead um, Siena. So it doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be uh, known that the statements are false. So we're starting with a district court opinion that basically ignores, I see your light on Judge Wynn, okay, that basically ignores two of this court's most relevant precedents. Um, we talk about um, the 4%, and obviously that's a bone of contention between the parties. We've cut down a few trees in our briefs talking about it, but but I, I would leave the court with this. If 4% weren't material, then the stock wouldn't have dropped as much as it did. If it really was just 4% and it was a blip on the radar screen, then the market would have yawned. The market didn't yawn, didn't yawn because it thought it was important. Um, let me uh, let me address the, the trading plans and, and, and that probably will lead me to running out of time. Um, before or after does matter, let me, let me explain why. There's a good faith element of a, of a 10B51 complaint. That's why it's very, very hard to, to make, an, make an absolute defense argument on the pleadings, because good faith is typically a factual issue. Um, if you enter into a plan at any time during the class period, when it's alleged that you had knowledge of what was going on, then you can't have entered into a plan without knowledge of material of non-public information. The two just can't be juxtaposed with one another. And so, it does matter. It's not in the record. It does matter, but the district court made it matter. And that's, in, uh, in my view, a reversible error. Um, let, me, uh, let me end with, with one other thing about the comparative analysis in Tel Aviv. The comparative analysis in Tel Aviv must be based on the facts alleged. That is, the district court is free to look at reasonable inferences that can be concluded from the facts alleged. From the facts alleged, I helped write that complaint. The district court said, "Well, these the the innocent inference, you know, they had a genuine belief that their programs were going to work."
That may very well turn out to be true after summary judgment and a trial, but we're not there. We're on the pleadings. And I would, I would say that you can look at that complaint for a long time, and I, again, I helped write it. There's nothing there. There are no facts there from which you can infer the genuine belief that the district court found. And again, uh, appellate courts play a very valuable role. They not only make the rules, but they need to make sure that the rules are followed, not only by litigants, but by lower courts. And I would submit respectfully that that did not occur here. And unless the court has any time, I will, uh, any additional questions, I will be quiet. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Judges, do you have any further questions? No. Well, I thank you, Mr. Levin. I thank you, Ms. Wine, for your presentations. Court will now um, adjourn and proceed to, uh, uh, at least for today, and proceed to our special room for deliberation. Thank you both. Thank you again. Thank you. This honorable court stand adjourned. This is tomorrow morning, God save the United States and this honorable court. Thank <laughs> you.